saying, you know, who's in the room? And I think it's just of that that most of you are either working in small businesses or you are a small business owner. Sure. Yep. Yep. How many of you think you already have a brand? Okay, this is a participatory session. I'm going to be asking you questions. I'm going to ask you to take out a pen and paper now because I'm going to give you some things that you can work on on your own moving forward that hopefully you'll be able to branch off of this. I always believe sessions, you should be able to walk away from something that's tangible and that can help you move your business forward. I do it all the time. I go to conferences all the time. Everyone and I see each other at conferences quite a bit, actually, usually in other parts of the country. Um, so anyway, today we're going to talk about Shark Tank and beyond, because it's really, Shark Tank is a great opportunity for marketing, but you need to be set up before you even get there, right? So just give you little tips on some branding and some strategies in order to grow your business. All right? So for some of you who don't know what I do, I, my name is Julie Goldman. I am the founder and CEO of the Original Runner Company, and this is what I do. I make the world's only non-slip fabric aisle runners. We customize them and for corporate events, weddings, special events. We sell all over the world. We've done 25,000 weddings in the last 12 years. And our company was already approximately uh, nine years old when I was on Shark Tank. Although they often portray it as a new business, we were not a new business. And we were a lot larger than we actually appeared on the show. So I'll just tell you that Shark Tank is a reality show. Um, and not everything you see is real, and especially on the new show, Beyond the Tank. So just keep that in mind. So our brand is worldwide. We ship everywhere. The majority of my customers are actually um, wholesale. I sell mostly to um, event planners, florists, venues, corporate universities. Um, in addition, the majority of my customers are not buying these unbelievably ornate custom runners, but they're buying a simple white or ivory aisle runner that is fabric with a non-slip backing that's safe. And I'm bringing this up because we're going to mark towards, we're going to walk towards some branding. And so, overall, this this idea of what we do. So, how did I start? I'll give you a little tiny snippet of that. You know, most of you will say, people tell you all the time that you should find something you're passionate about and then get that, make that your business. I actually don't believe that. I actually think if you often take things you're passionate about making your business, you're less passionate about it eventually because it's now your job. How many people started off as painters and they started making a company, for example, and all of a sudden they're in sales? I know I'm in sales now. I don't touch aisle runners on a daily basis, even though the one I started, that's what I did. So the idea is, you know, making sure that you love business. Why is it that most restaurants fail? Anyone have an idea? Everybody knows the answer to this. Because people who open restaurants are chefs. chefs. Do chefs know much about business? No. no. And the idea is, is that if you go open a new restaurant in this town, for example, and your neighbor says, oh my gosh, have you been to the new Greek place in town? The first question you're going to ask is, how was it? How was the service? So you're going to get one of two answers, right? You're going to get that answer that either says, oh my god, it's so great, you have to go try it, it was amazing, and you probably will. Or you're going to get that person who says, oh my gosh, the service was so bad, and it was slow, and it was mediocre, and you're likely not to try it. What I think restaurant owners often don't understand is that initial peek into their business is their brand. And that's going to determine whether they succeed or they don't. Okay, we're getting back to that, I promise. Do you already want to go there? I feel like I missed a slide. Hold on a second. Yeah, there's a slide missing. Eh. Okay, there's a slide missing. Never mind. So the next slide would have been, oh, who am I? <laughs> so basically, yes, um, you know, my company has been on Shark Tank. We've been featured in every major business magazine, including Entrepreneur, Inc., Cranes. We've been on every major wedding television show. And the majority of my business is weddings, about 90%. We also do corporate events, as you see here. We'll do bat mitzvahs and sweet 16s and uh, college events and initiations and orientations and things like that. So probably you're thinking, I just love weddings. But I'm going to let you know a little secret. I don't. I was never that girl who had the binder, who was waiting to get married. And in fact, I eloped on a beach in Hawaii with my husband. And I didn't have all this. And the idea is I love entrepreneurship. That's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about small business and taking an idea and growing it into a business. This is actually my third successful business. Um, the first one was something I grew myself. And the second one we sold. My husband and I ran it together. We sold it very successfully in 2009. Before I started, right, as actually a couple years after I already started this company. So this company has been growing very steadily all the years that I've owned it. It's grown about 20 to 25 percent a year, except for 2009, which none of us grew in 2009. And um, since being on Shark Tank, the company has grown 72 percent in total. Um, but 
when the show obviously initially aired, we had a very nice bump, about 600% for the first six months. So everybody gets that little push, and then eventually it does die. So how do you capture that? How do you use your brand and not make my brand about Shark Tank? I mean, I'm proud to say I was on the show, and I'm happy to speak about it, but that's not what my brand is. My brand isn't Shark Tank contestant, right? So what is a brand? I think most of you would think that a brand, for example, is um, you know, your logo, your name, or what you do. Let's talk about what really branding is, because the idea is if you don't understand what your brand is, you're never going to be able to sell it. So I have a nine-year-old daughter, and I tell her all the time about confidence, right? I'm trying to instill her to be a confident woman. And I say to her, you, you can't sell something that you don't believe. If you don't believe you're smart, if you don't believe you're beautiful, if you don't believe you have everything, how are you going to sell it to everybody else? And it's really so much more impactful in your businesses. If you don't think your business is the best at what you do, or that you differentiate yourself in a way that you can articulate and sell to your prospective clients, they'll never believe it either. So we're going to talk about branding today. All right. So I didn't know if this was going to have all those fancy schmancy moving in and out because of my remote, so I have everything up here, which I normally don't do. So to me, what's interesting to know is that people have brilliant ideas every single day, don't they? Worldwide, millions of products are brought to market every year, and a whopping 95% of them will fail. They won't even make it past the first year. So how do you make sure you're part of that 5% that actually succeed? Well, I actually think it all comes down to branding initially. That first year is making sure people who know who you are and what you stand for. So people often think branding is what? Your logo, your website, what you look like, but it's not. Branding is actually the message that you're trying to build in someone's mind of the perception of your world. So for example, you know, we are, we're going to throw out some ideas in a minute about that, but it's really what's the recall when I say Nike? What's the recall when I say Apple? And that's what your brand is. It's not the name and it's not the logo. It's what people perceive you to be. And in doing so, your brand is essentially what? Your reputation and it's your promise that you make to your customers. And if you don't deliver on that promise every single time, are they coming back? Absolutely not. And that's what your brand is. It's knowing you're going to get that consistent experience, whether you're selling it, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, whether it's a restaurant, every single time. How many times have you gone back to that favorite restaurant and you have this meal that you really, really love and you had it, you couldn't believe how delicious, and you go the next time and it's either off the menu or you have it and it doesn't taste anything like it did the first time, likely you won't return there because that's really what your brand is about. It's delivering a consistent experience to your clients over and over. So for us, strong brand awareness will obviously solidify your identity throughout your industry, but it's also what creates brand loyalty. If people know who you are, know what you stand for, then they're going to come back each time. I'm gonna say this a lot because it's in a message that gets lost with so many people. Um, for example, and my, my favorite example is, if you have a Big Mac, if you have it in China, if you have it in France, if you have it in America. Now, personally, I've never had a Big Mac, but my understanding is they all taste the same. And the idea is that when you have that McDonald's experience, you know exactly what you're getting every single time. McDonald's isn't the arches, although that's the highly recognizable part of it. McDonald's is your inexpensive fast food experience, and you know what you're getting every single time. And so that's the important part. It's looking at your branding experience. It's really your brand is exactly what it's there. It's your loyalty, your identity, your value, your perception, which is the number one thing. And of course, your awareness in the community. So everyone here thinks they have a brand. I want you to start sort of ruminating over that concept of what really does your brand stand for? And what do people perceive when they think of you? So my brand is a good example. I think people think your brand is your product, is it? No, right? So we're going to talk about it. Because really your brand is the what and the how. So the what, we're going to address each of these separately. But the what isn't your product. Your what is that most extensible brands usually only represent one what to their customers. Okay? So the idea isn't your product, it's the overarching, again, perception of what people think about your brand. So cementing this, of course, will build confidence in your ability to deliver that message every single time. So, for example, my company's what isn't idle runners. It's actually that I make safe, luxurious, safe luxury. And that's what we're about. And there's a part of that for us is also reliability. I have, you know, repeat customers who come back to us who will call me and say, oh, I have an event this weekend. I need this. We say, fine. It goes out the door. And they know. 
that it's going to be delivered every single time, the exact same way, the quality is going to be exactly the same, and if you were to Google my company, which I strongly recommend that you do, not because I want you to look us up, but because you'd be hard pressed to find a negative review in 12 years. And I pride myself on that. It's part of our sales pitch. When people call and they're ordering a product from someone on the internet, always a little sketchy, my price point average is five to seven hundred dollars. So I'm asking someone who's never met me and having a five minute conversation with to give me their credit card and give me five to seven hundred dollars in a very quick amount of time based strictly on photos they see on the internet. The reason that they do is because I'll say to them, go ahead and look my company up. Go ahead and research us on the Knot and all the other wedding sites and you're going to find that people are only going to say how we deliver timely, we delivered a solid product, and that we made sure that we were delivering our promise every single time. So let's talk about some brands that you're really familiar with and what their what is. So obviously these are my interpretations, my perceptions of their brand and what I think their brand is. So Apple, right, it's your cool and it's innovative and stylish. I mean, you look at Windows, you can look at IBM. Does IBM have the same brand as an Apple? Right? What's the huge difference there? Anyone want to sort of yell it out? <laughs> Nobody wants to yell it out. Apple I, has some emotion. IBM feels like Thank you, Ramon. So the idea is that, you know, Apple is you think you're going to get it, and it's going to be a cool-looking device. It's going to be the most contemporary. It's going to be the newest. And then, you know, you like your IBM. It's a very nice IBM thing pad right here. Do I think it's the most stylish computer I've ever seen? Probably not, right? So who's your market? Knowing who you're marketing to. Is IBM marketing all the time to those 20-somethings out there? Or is Apple marketing to them? So if Apple's marketing to them, they know what those millennials want. So you have to understand what your clients, your prospective clients, or who you want to be your clients, actually want, and market your brand accordingly. And the brand has to be shaped that way. You've seen a lot of recently, you know, older brands reshaping themselves to try to land that newer market. Sometimes it falls short, and sometimes it works really, really well. And when it works really well, it's because they've taken the time to understand who they're selling to and what's important to them. Now, I'm looking around this room, and I see very few millennials in this room, to be honest with you. So for us to look at, and I can put myself in that category of not being a millennial either, the idea of what's important to them sometimes requires market research. Sometimes it requires focus groups. I have a staff of women who work for me who are all in their 20s. And I do sit down with them and say, what do you guys do? What are your favorite movies? What do you like to do? What kind of clothes are you wearing? What's the hot color for you guys? Because that's going to dictate to my 20-something brides what's going to work for them and what's going to be appealing. Because I'm going in from a totally different perspective, right? When I was, if I was going to plan a wedding today, my perspective on what a cool wedding would be may not be the same as someone who's 24 years old. So understanding you know, who your client base is and making sure your brand reflects the perception of that they would want to see of you. And it can be dual. You can have it for different marketing opportunities, but the brand itself definitely has to stand for something. I love the idea of Zappos. Does anyone buy from Zappos here besides me because I hate to go shoe shopping? Okay. So I recently had a really interesting experience with Zappos, and this is what solidifies for me their brand. Obviously, you can get your shoes overnight. That's pretty cool, right? You don't have to go try them on in the store, all that kind of stuff. But I called Zappos up because I had returned something with their free shipping back and forth, which we love. And I called them up because I said that I hadn't received a credit for a package I had sent back. I didn't see it on my bank statement. And I call up and the guy's like, I'll look into it for you, but Ms. Goldman, we feel so bad that you had to call in. Please take a $25 credit to your account to apply the next time you call, the next time you order shoes. And as I'm talking to him on the phone, I'm going through my account online and I find the credit. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I actually found the credit. You don't have to give me that credit. Oh no, you had to pick up the phone today. We feel bad. We wow. feel like that is it. That is Zappos to a T. The people who work there believe in it. They drink the Kool-Aid, and, it, and it's so true though. They really do. And I hung up the phone saying, "I'm gonna buy all my shoes from Zappos." What a nice experience, right? So I mean, the truth is, you know, having a small child. And taking her shoe shopping is just a nightmare. So I'll buy like 12 pairs of shoes on Zappos, keep one and send the rest back. And shipping's free back and forth. I'm not doing an ad, an ad for Zappos, but the concept that that's what their brand is about. Their brand isn't that logo. Who cares about the logo? It's really about their message. And I know that, and I become a brand ambassador for them because I'm a true believer. American Express, one of my favorite examples of really brilliant branding. Who here is an American Express card of any color? Okay, yeah. Who has a Discover card? Oh, okay. No, don't be embarrassed. It's okay. So I say about once a month we get someone who wants to use a Discover card at my company. We don't carry Discover. We don't. 
why do you have, now people who in here have an American Express card, no one who here has a free American Express card? Really, there are a couple, I know there's a few of you there, but most of you are paying at least $75 probably for your card a year, or 100 or 500 or whatever it is. Why in the world would someone pay for a credit card when they can get one for free? Anyone? <laughs> what are, thank you, you drink the Kool-Aid. So tell me, that, isn't that so interesting? What are your benefits? Uh, do you use them? Okay, okay, love it. Yep. Protection. Yes, fraud protection, very good. Do you think your other cards, your free cards, don't offer you fraud protection? <laughs> so you have a perceived value of American Express, don't we all? We all think American Express and we either think, wow, that's a card for someone of a certain caliber. Or we're thinking we get great protection, or I get my membership reward points, or whatever it is. Customer service. Customer service, exactly. It's that same Zappos feeling, right? You call up, they're going to take good care of you. And that's the difference between a Discover and an American Express. I'm poo pooing Discover, no offense. But the idea is people aren't willing to pay for a Discover card because the benefits or the perceived value of that brand isn't there. And I think they do it almost better than anyone, don't they? So I like BMW. I was doing this presentation with my husband last night, and I was like, honey, what's your perception of BMW? What's their brand? He's ultimate driving machine, right? So I put it on there as ultimate driving machine, but one of my, my brand perception of BMW is a guy driving a stick shift. Yeah. Right? He doesn't have a car seat in the back. <laughs> no, no. And if for some reason he had to have kids and had to put a car seat, he's getting this SUV, isn't he? So the concept, again, is BMW is saying to you, you could have gotten the Kia Sorento once you got your kids, but no, you're going to get that BMW because even though you have changed your you want that ultimate driving machine. It has told you that it's going to drive like a sports car you're never going to own. And that's the reality. The marketing behind developing this brand is that the logo itself just tells you, and, it's, and again, it's never about the logo, but the concept of the brand is if you can afford a BMW you drive it, you're going to feel like you're driving in the Indies or track. And that's what they want you to believe. So how about Applebee's? Who's been doing Applebee's lately? Okay. So I'm driving in Florida not too long ago. We were on this huge stretch of highway where there was like nowhere to eat forever. And we came across a couple of places and my daughter's yelling she's hungry. And a few of the places were like, you know, divey bars, you know, Nick's Pub or something. We didn't know what they were. And then we saw an Applebee's. Now, I personally don't eat at Applebee's all the time. I tend to eat a little healthier. But I knew that we could go to Applebee's. Why? Because I knew it would be the, the menu. I knew what you'd get. I knew it would be clean. I knew there's a corporate standard that went along with this brand, and that brand sells itself as the family comfort food experience. It's affordable, you're not gonna get ripped off, and you know exactly what you're getting with the brand. So again, we're not talking, I put the logos up there, I was iffy about putting them up there because it's not about the logos, is it? It's really about the brand and what they're selling. And then one of my personal favorites is, is TED Talks. Who here is, has seen a TED Talk? And anyone who's not raising their hand should absolutely go out there and try to see some TED Talks that interest you. Amazing experience. I've had friends that have done them, and they're incredible. And when I think of TED, does anyone, what do you think of anyone out here who likes TED? What do you think of when you think of TED? Come on, you guys raised your hand. Someone, someone has an opinion. Inspirational. Inspirational, right? And aren't they coming across positivity, good ideas, knowledge, and the person is up there, maybe not the Monica Lewinsky one for some of you, but for most of you, the people who get up there, you think they're knowledgeable, don't you? You respect them right away because they were vetted by TED. And to go through that process, even get ready for a TED Talk is unbelievable. So to me, I, it's a, an automatic authenticity for me and it gives them a certain caliber. And I love that, that some people may not even think of them as a brand, but they sure are and their brand is so finely developed and it works beautifully. So, so many of you have had business in here and I want at least two people to tell me, stand up and give me your name, your company name, and, and what is your what? What is your what? Someone want to volunteer? Yes, sir. Good, uh, my name is Shogun. My company is called Shogun Enterprises and we actually help entrepreneurs get out of their show. No, that's not your what. You're telling me what you do. Don't tell me what you do. What's the perceived about the perception of your brand? What is your brand? What's your what? Strength and empowerment. Strength and what? Empowerment. Strength and empowerment. Okay. And that's what your clients would think of you when they when they see your brand, right? right? Developing that. Ma'am. Yes. Hi, I'm Yael, and I have uh, an online uh, fashion uh, jewelry company. Oh, 
Online fashion jewelry. Okay. And what's your what? Trendy, um, trendy uh, fashion jewelry with affordable prices, and it's called Chic 24 Hours. So when someone goes to your site, when someone thinks of your company, are they thinking it's fashion forward, it's inexpensive? What's your yes, affordable yep. fashion, okay. affordable okay. trendy fashion. Jewelry. But see, nailing it down isn't as easy as it sounds, right? I started doing all this and I was like, what's my what? Well, my what is an eyeliners, but it is, but it isn't. So kind of really trying to drill down. If you don't know what your what is, start asking your customers. You know, it's okay to say, you know, I'm trying to figure out what you guys think of our brand. We want to make sure that we're sending our brand message across to you that you know what it is and what could that be. Because branding isn't always just about understanding what your what is, but how do you convey your what? And that's the how. So the how is the many, many, many ways that you can deliver your what to your customers, right? There's a ton of ways to do this. And for some companies, they choose nice little tag words to do that. And it could be, it's depend, you're the dependable company, they know they can count on you, like a FedEx. Maybe you're the cheapest option. Maybe you're recycled, you're luxury, you're organic, you're innovative, you're comforting, whatever your brand is. I actually, I was watching when I was doing this, I had seen an ad for a company that was, I can't remember what it was now, sorry, it was like a dog food brand and it was, I think, Blue something, I forget the name of it. And their whole concept was, we don't have any fillers or junk in our food. We are all natural. We're the all natural dog food. And that's really all that mattered to people who don't want to buy your Alco full of fillers kind of dog food. And did it differentiating yourself in some way. So my thing is, what is your differentiator? So what is my differentiator? I am the most expensive. Is that a good differentiator? Absolutely. You know what? Doesn't hurt my business. I sell more than any of my competition altogether. And the reason isn't because I am the most expensive. That's a deterrent for some people. Some people are price sensitive. But for us, that are we. Hmm? That might need quality. Exactly. The reason that we're so much more expensive is because our competition only sells paper and plastic runners that tear and rip and cost $15, where my price point starts at $165. And price isn't an issue for my client, quality is. So I always navigate my brand to quality. Quality and dependability, our reliability, all those factors. Because the fact is, if you don't know what differentiates you from your competition, how can you work towards making that what your brand stands for? So another thing that can differentiate you is that my company is the innovator of our industry. When I started, I was the only game in town, I started this industry and in doing so I get to dictate the trends and it's really fun that way and we try to stay ahead of the game when people stop copying us we stop making that product when people start doing things the same way because you know what they'll end up doing it cheaper than I can do it and so I'll say fine let's not do that now let's go back and make fully litter dial runners let's cover them with Swarovski crystals let's do something else to make sure that people know if they're looking for the newest and the latest we're the only game in town so Delivering your how is probably the most important thing because your customers are going to somewhat help you shape your what. Although I personally think your what should come from you. It should be what you want people to perceive, not what the perception is. Because if you're out there and you find out that the perception of your brand, your what, is actually not what you intended, then you need to make a big change, right? That's often happening with brands, for example, that are outdated. Um, I just saw the other day, I don't know if you saw that Kentucky Fried Chicken, or KFC, excuse me, is coming out now with a new line of commercials, and they're bringing back Colonel Sanders. Um, one of the SNL guys is going to be playing Colonel Sanders, and they decided to go back to what worked. And they're bringing him back as their spokesperson, and they are no longer going to be KFC. They're going back, and they're going to be Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because after trying to make their what? Healthy fried chicken, they figured out, guess what, that doesn't work. And so they're going back to what worked. And the same concept, the idea that what difference is, we were talking about, again, was in my office, we were discussing this yesterday, brands that really need an update. And we were talking about brands like Friendly's. For anyone who lives in the New York, New Jersey area, you've probably been to a Friendly's once in your lifetime. Has that chain ever changed? No. Right? And when you see one, you think it looks old. I know I went to one to take my daughter there recently to go to one just to get ice cream, to get the big gym dandy, and the place looked exactly like it did when I was 13. I mean, exactly. And I've never seen a brand who needs a renovation or a rebranding so much. And that's, you know, where would it? So how do you deliver that how is obviously a consistent message about your brand. And that can translate anything. It can be every single time the phone rings, it should be answered the same way. It can be every time that you're posting across social media. So we're going to touch this thing. So using social media in a smart way to convey your message 
is obviously important. There's a ton of social media um, sessions today. I'm not going to waste your time talking about it. But I will say this. Your social media presence should reflect the what of your company. So if your company has this gorgeous website, it's very sophisticated, or maybe it's very intellectual, and then you're on social media cursing, uh, attacking your competitors, doing anything else that doesn't represent your brand and your what, then you need to stop that and rethink the way you're positioning yourself and how you're putting yourself out to the world. Because that is, I mean, there's been so many missteps on Twitter by, by uh, companies lately, it's been almost comical. You wonder how these people even get these tweets up there, what huge mistakes they made, and how they hurt their brand and their what. Because their delivery method isn't working. So uh, the idea of humanizing the brand. So how many of you are a single person in businesses? Okay. So you are your brand, aren't you? Right? People know the brand because they know you. But for other people who own companies, then that's important because people like to work with people they like. So in a single operation for, you know, business, it is important that you are consistent in your delivery. You can't just be one way with people you like and one way with these people or one way with these vendors. You have to be the same with everybody. Again, your personality when you're in a single operation business, you are the what. And that's unfortunate but true. But for people who have more employees and have a larger company, humanizing your business. And this is one that kind of took me a little bit of time to sort of come around to because when I started to come my this business, I didn't want it to be Julie's Isle Runners. I A, because I'm always the queen of the exit strategy and I'm always planning for my exit strategy. Therefore, I don't want to name it after myself. But I also didn't want to be the face of the business. Now that's kind of contradictory to the fact that I went on Shark Tank and kind of put myself out there. But I did that for my business. I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to be, you know, on reality TV, to be honest, and I hadn't done to see me on reality TV ever again. But I did that for my company. But the fact that I did it changed my business. And not because I had more sales or not because we had more PR. That's definitely part of it. But the bigger and I turned my head because I'm hearing something behind my head. Um, the bigger part of it is that excuse me is People really liked having a face to associate to my business. They love, and especially women, because I obviously sell a lot to women, given that I sell mostly for weddings. When I appeared on Shark Tank, one of the things that came out of it was over 2,000 You Go Girl emails the next day. <laughs> and in, I don't know who in the room has or hasn't seen my episode. It was a little cantankerous, and they called me snarky. But, you know, I'm not exactly a wallflower, kind of cut down to the pressure. Um, so I stood up for myself, which led to some interesting arguments on the show. Um, but it really inspired women, and I, I didn't expect that takeaway. And for me, it has been the most um, gratifying part of the experience, has been the number of women I've mentored since being on the show, um, and also the number of people who said, I, you know, you were the first woman who went on there and knew her numbers and, and stood up to them and did this, you go girl. And I love that. Now, of course, there's always going to be these random ones who call me a narcissist and a whole bunch of awful names. But that was, honestly, I can count those on one hand. And I was really pleased, you know, to see that. Um, be a brand storyteller is a great way to deliver your how. PR people and media love a great story. So I tell the story when I, about how I actually started this business because although I told you that my husband and I did elope, which is the truth, um, a year later we did have a reception for all of our family who were pretty upset about the fact that we didn't invite them. So we did have your big black tie traditional Saturday night wedding and we needed an aisle runner and the only thing available was paper or plastic and I said, I can't be the only one who doesn't want to put something like a child's party tablecloth down the middle of my wedding. And therefore, I created this product for myself and it kind of grew from there. But that story, people love that story. You need to have a good story as part of your brand. People want to know how you got there. Where are you going with it? Why did you come up with it? And that is always inspirational for people. And people enjoy knowing a little more about the brand because it goes back to the humanization of the brand. That it wasn't like, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of Silicon Valley you know, entrepreneurs out there that are constantly launching new businesses. And as wonderful as it is for them, people have trouble connecting with those brands because they don't feel it's as genuine as someone who worked hard to develop this. Like some, when you hear Mark Zuckerberg's story about you know, how he started Facebook versus you know, someone who's been the CEO of five different Silicon Valley you know, companies, it's a different story. And it makes 
there's a reason there's a social, you know, there's a reason there's a movie about Facebook, and there isn't one about Survey Monkey. I probably shouldn't have used that example. Um, <laughs> sorry, no, that's not even funny. I'm sorry, that was probably inappropriate. Um, and then obviously, amazing customer service is the biggest, one of the biggest hows. How many of you called up a company that you loved and then had a horrible customer service experience on the phone? All the time, right? Incredibly disappointing. And then you hang up and you're like, I don't want to order from them again because they were so awful, but I really like this X, whatever it is. The truth is, when I hire people, I am hiring brand ambassadors. And that is the truth. They are brand stewards, as I like to call them as well, and they have to drink the Kool-Aid. You have to believe that what you're doing and the people who are working for you have to believe that what you're doing and that your what is genuine, and that your what and how you're delivering your what is part of their job. Because a lot of people think that their job is just to come and show up there, right? Do the job, I enter things, I pack things, whatever it is. But really, they are a brand steward, whether they're in your office or whether they're out at a party and someone says, hey, what do you do? And they go, oh, I work for so-and-so. Or it's like, oh my god, I work for this, and I love it, and they're the best. If you need shoes, call Zappos. But those Zappos employees, they do that. They they're, love it. They're religious about it. I'm not saying we're all going to get that, but the idea that your people who work for you are your brand stewards. They really are. And every single time that someone comes in contact with them, it should be a positive experience that reflects really well on your what and on your brand. Okay? And lastly, that's a little group we talk, oops, sorry, getting stuck in my heels, um, is the idea of fostering a positive association with your brand, and obviously not a negative association with your brand. Um, during the Super Bowl, what was the hugest negative association ad that aired? You remember? Sorry? <laughs> no, it was the insurance company with the little boy who yeah. dies, wow. right? Uh, Horrific. Everyone was like, statewide, what were you thinking? And you know, it was a horrible commercial. If you don't know the story, we can talk about it later. But it was a horrible, horrible story. And statewide immediately removed it. What a massive mistake. And what a, it didn't follow their what. That wasn't what the brand statewide was about. I mean, it is. It's about, God forbid, this kid gets hurt and this is what happens. But the idea that they didn't follow true to their brand hurt them dramatically. It hurt their stock. It hurt their perception. It hurt every part of it. And they've worked really hard to recoup some of that since then. So the idea of a negative association can tank your business, but you can build a positive association right from the start. One of the biggest ways that companies do this, and anyone want to take a guess that how companies do the biggest positive association for their brand? Super easy. Hmm? Sure. Thank you. Philanthropy. Exactly. The number one way. Number one. And you can do that on a smaller level as well. We do. Um, our charity of choice, for example, is Breast Cancer Awareness in honor of my late mother. And we donate um, approximately 5,000 yards of pink fabric every October to any breast cancer event who calls us. And we believe in it, and we, we make it our message, we promote it, um, and we'll put it out there on Twitter and Facebook. If you're having a breast cancer event, call us. We're there for you. We'll donate our fabric. And we don't wait for people to call us. We make sure you know that that's our cause, and we believe in it. So, we talked a lot about the what and the how and the brand, but it's important to understand the difference between, obviously, brand, identity, and the logo. So we talked a little about brand, right? The brand is the perceived perception of your company, the perception of your company, and then, and then your identity is what? Besides what I wrote there. What's your name? Name some things. And come on. All right, I'll do your website, your collateral. USB. USB? Yeah, yeah uh, unique selling property. There you go, exactly. But it's more than that. Your identity in this concept, though, is going to be more about what you're putting out there. So it's going to be everything from your social media to your website to your collateral to, your, to everything that you put out there to represent your brand. In a restaurant example, again, it's your interiors. And then, of course, there's your logo. But your logo is the smallest part. It isn't, you know, people spend millions of dollars, right, redoing their logos. And it is important, but it isn't as important as what message your logo conveys through your branding. So I encourage you to do this little exercise, which is come up with your single, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so logo would be part of your identity. It is part of your identity. It is a piece of what goes on your identity, but the fact is if you're, if I was to give you this, this Infusionsoft book, I'm just going to give you an example. Here's your Infusionsoft book, right? So I've got this book here, little tiny, tiny Infusionsoft right here. So this logo isn't what your piece of identity about. But this is a piece of identity. And how you put this together reflects, again, back to your brand and your what. This is a how delivery system right here. So each of you should be doing a little exercise. And I say vision statement, but and people think that's like sort of your vision for your whole company, and it is in a sense. But I like the idea of saying, using your vision statement, it should be short and sweet and one line to say, in a sense, what is your what going to be? So Amazon, I think, has a great vision statement. I'm going to read it. 
It's to build a place where people can come to find anything they want to buy online. So last week on, on Amazon, I bought a case of water and my husband bought a blow-up boat. So in the same cart, in the same shopping cart, right? That's the beauty of Amazon, isn't it? And everything was delivered in like two days because I'm Prime for free. And they get me to pay for it. Brilliant. So that is a big part of, of it is understanding what your message is and what you really are trying to sell to your people. So I want to give you a really good example of, of rebranding. And it's Church of the Cupcakes. I'm a big fan of Church of the Cupcakes. And I think it's a fantastic story and that's why I want to share it with you. So Church of the Cupcakes spent four years as lovely confections. Had this really simple logo, it's just typeface, very small cupcake business in Denver, and that was it. Nothing too much came of it. And one day, she decided that she needed to rebrand. She didn't feel it represented who she was and what her goal was for the company. And she wanted her company, her brand became, and her what became, cupcakes with a smile. Why, why would a cupcake, well, all cupcakes probably make you smile, but she really wanted her cupcakes to send a message. So she changed her name to Church of the Cupcakes and her slogan became Worshippers Welcome. And you'll see her daily prayers are her daily um, assortment of cupcakes that are offered. And they all go right into her brand, everything from raptured raspberry to kindred spirits. But what I love about Church of the Cupcakes is that you remember it. It's memorable. It's merchandisable. And in fact, um, there's a fantastic company um, called Eat My Words, which you see on the bottom. Um, I know Alexandra Well, who owns it. She's an amazing branding expert. And she did this branding. And she went to her and said, you know, this is what it's going to be. And she said, well, this is how much it's going to cost to rebrand you. And it wasn't cheap, won't lie. But she actually, a woman who owns Church of the Cupcakes, made all of the money back that she spent on the rebranding in the first four months in t-shirts alone of her new branding material. Because she opened up, so she started with what were her principles. Instead of a one-line vision statement, in her store she has a huge wall that she calls her Ten Commandments. And these were just three of them, obviously. We shall break from scratch. We shall faithfully use renewable packaging, and we shall love and honor sprinkles. <laughs> and, that, and, that, and there's always a tongue-in-cheek element to it, but at the same time, she's telling you, we recycle, we're renewable, we bake from scratch. They make cupcakes every two hours. If the cupcakes are sitting longer than two hours, she throws them out. Everything is fresh. You go there, you know what you're getting. Right? She does cooking classes that she calls Sunday School, and she has an online store called The Church Bazaar where she sells these adorable t-shirts such as Worship, it says right here, Worship These Cupcakes, um, Heavenly Sinful, and Forgive Me Father for I Have Binged. That is her number one seller. And she, that's how she makes her money. She makes now 25% of her profits, profits come from t-shirts because of the merchandising from her brand. And then of course in every single in her store she has a confectional instead of a confessional which is her photo booth and of course a foosball table because every church basement has a foosball table. <laughs> in the last year she's also introduced um, bicycle uh, carts where she drives around Denver and at street fairs and sells her cupcakes that way as well. And her company has grown upwards of 800% since she did this two years ago. So it's a lesson in not being overly creative with your branding. This is obviously an incredibly overly creative you know, version of branding. Um, but I would say it's taking your brand and owning it. Right? Understanding that her brand isn't is Church of the Cupcakes, but not the logo. Well, I, could, I didn't even need to show you the logo to tell you the story, did I? Because it isn't about that. It's simply the concept that she took her and she's faithful to it. Ha, a little irony there. And she, and she follows and she follows through with it. And it is a huge part of you know what makes her successful. And I love that concept. And when I need to think about my brand and I think about am I being true to it? Do I follow my what every single day? And I honestly, I do. I won't sell something I'm not proud of. We often have clients that will call us and send us their invitation or a design or something. And it's clip art, you know, something they grab from the internet. It's not quite clever. It's a little bit goofy. Um, and we try to say, oh, you know, we can. We have a graphic designer on staff. We can fix this for you. And they're dead set on it. But the truth is, I want to send something out that we can be proud of. But I also have to honor what the client wants. So sometimes we'll get deep into a project and we'll realize it's not working, especially when a client for our product wants something painted in pastel pink. Pastel pink is very pretty, but it doesn't work for lettering. You won't be able to see it more than one foot away from it. It won't show up in your photos. And I know that if this client gets her wedding pictures back, she's going to be pissed. That's the truth. She's going to say, it's not what I wanted. I paid $800 for this. What the heck? And so we'll call her and we'll say, this isn't working. This is what we would like to do. And we'll do that for every client. I will never send something out unless I'm forced to do it by the client. We have one right now that we're being forced to put together that I'm not going to. But um, 
kind of silly. But we do try our best to make sure that everything that gets delivered. And part of that isn't because I want my client to be happy, of course. But a wedding, for me, every one of those bridesmaids is a prospective customer. Every person that sees the photographs of that wedding at their planner, at the venue, at the florist, sees it in the magazine, is a prospective customer. And I always have to put my stuff out there as best as possible. You know, one of the things that we didn't sort of address in the beginning, I kind of jumped through, was when I first started, um, you know, I came up with this concept. I hired this guy when, when the Village Voice was still a newspaper we all read. read. Um, I hired some of this artist out of the Village Voice, and I had him create these like fake runners, and we photographed them, and we put them up on the website because we weren't in business. And the very first day that the website went live in 2003, now there was internet in 2003, but it's definitely nothing like it is now. And finding things, search engines, were not like they were. So I'm always still amazed that people found us back then. But we did take orders the very first day that we launched. And in fact, the first person who ever ordered met me in the basement of Penn Station, and I paid her cash. And she paid me cash. And I paid her for it. She paid me cash. Who does that, right? Um, and every year on her anniversary, I sent her a gift card. Every year. She's been married 12 years, and every year we sent her a gift card to a different store. And it's just become sort of a joke in our company that you know she took a chance on us. Um, but about a month after that, we did a wedding for Lifetime Television, and it became our most popular runner, which is the And They Lived Happily Ever After runner. How are we on time? I have nowhere to go. About you got 15 minutes. 15 yeah. minutes. There's only plenty of time for Q&A. Okay. And so essentially where I'm going with this is that I knew that for a luxury brand such as mine, where I needed to get coverage, I wanted to be in bridal magazines, I probably needed to get on the celebrity market. And that became, and that's the slide that was missing, <laughs> was uh, some of our celebrity clients and some of the big events that we've done. I don't know where it went. Um, but essentially, the idea that we needed that. So within the first month, we did a wedding for Lifetime Television. And the third month we were open, we did the Bachelorette's TV wedding. And that's where business just sort of took off. I realized that my brand needed to be seen as a luxury brand that services not just, you know, um, celebrity. And as you saw our Shark Tank episode, the big battle I had with Kevin O'Leary as he kept calling him, all my other clients' toilet bowl weddings, which I disagree with vehemently, because we really do want to be able to service everyone, whether you're having <coughs> excuse me, an inexpensive wedding or a multi-million dollar wedding. So I want to know, does anyone here have a brand hero they want to share just with the group, just so we can sort of get, like, see if we've learned anything here? You don't have to, but if you do. No? I do. Yeah. I, I don't know if I mentioned the question, but I like Charles Trewitt shirts. I, 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 Charles Cherwit, their shirts, is that a brand here? I, mean, like a company I don't name? know who that is. No, but that, you mean the noun, right? The co company name. Yeah, well, okay. the idea that it's a brand that speaks to you, that it's here because Charles you think Cherwit. that they sell their message, right? That their brand speaks to you and it delivers upon it every single time. So for me, it's their shirts. I have a shirt on. So, okay. And I was in a parking lot and somebody said, ooh, is that a Charles Cherwit shirt? I mean, people may not know them, but I love their shirts. I buy them when they're not sale, when they're on sale, when the price goes up 100%, I buy them all. Mm -hmm. So that's what I love. Does anyone else have one that they think delivers their message really clearly? Someone put their hand up. Yeah. Cole Haan. Cole Haan? Yeah, what's, what's, the, what's the what? Uh, I mean, I love their shoes because they're stylish and I just run them into the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, Someone's not You think Cole Haan is stylish and the shoes wear forever, yeah. right? And then when, you know what happens with Grace with Cole Haan as well? They, you fix them and they wear for another 10 years. <laughs> what else? Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? The children's place. What's their what? Uh, so children's clothes, affordable. Uh... That, okay, so their what isn't that they sell children's clothes, right? Their what is that they're affordable and do the clothes last? <coughs> yeah. Then? Okay, okay. You know, for everyday, <laughs> for everyday. Okay, everyday clothes. Yeah. Okay, someone else? Yes, sir, in the back. Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh -huh. yeah. What's the what? It's uh -huh. very tasteful and gives you the flavors that you want and they have different flavors. Perfect. I think that's absolutely true. Love Ben and Jerry's. So you just like your hand up, someone else will give your hand up. Oh, no, just... Nordstrom. Huh? Nordstrom. 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 That was on my original thing. You tell me why you say Nordstrom, because I think so, too. Oh, phenomenal customer service. Phenomenal. Yeah, and even the store brand shirts. I buy the wrinkle uh, free shirts. <laughs> the store brand shirts are top of I originally had a, a slide that actually compared Macy's to Nordstrom, because yeah. if you've ever been to either, the experience is so fundamentally different, but they're the same thing, right? They're department stores that sell a universal brand of things. But I can say, you know, we were discussing this in my office yesterday, and I was I was playing with my team. I'm like Macy's, and they're like messy store, can't find a service person, and the registers are never open, right? You go to Nordstrom, and you've got someone following you around with their little iPod, going, "Can I check you out now?" 
I mean, the experience is so fundamentally different. I'm willing to pay more to go to North Korea yes. for that reason, right? Yeah. They do what in a beautiful way. Awesome delivery. Anyone else? Yeah. Uber. Uber. Good yes. What's your Uber what? Um, personable, dependable. Mm-hmm. They're building their brand in a beautiful way. I think they're doing an excellent job building their brand, and I think we're all buying into that. Has anyone had a negative Uber experience, for example? You have? Okay. So there are going to be some, but my point is that there's no front or for arcing wise. Hmm? What were you going to say, though? But she said. No, I was going to say that the customer, right away, they answered and they rectified the situation. Perfect. And, you know, because not everything's always going to be perfect, right? But it's how we handle those hiccups and how the brand can't make sure, because part of that is, you know, I'm going to get people who are going to call me and, and not be happy on the phone, but I'm going to fix it so that you're not going to go out on the internet and tell everybody that I didn't handle it for you. I'm going to handle it, and I'm going to make sure. We actually have our policies to practice extreme customer service, is what we call it. And then, this is just a snapshot, we're not going to go through it, but this is what, um, in Eat My Words, they use this really great, does your brand pass the test? And I actually think this is truly true. So if, you know, we don't have to go through the whole thing, but if you want to take a shot of it, I think it's a great idea to understand it. And two of the things on the scratch side that I think are really important, um, I need a lot of, I do a lot of um, judging for entrepreneurial competitions and things like that. Pet peeve of mine is companies that I hear their name, I can't spell it, I can't find them on the internet. They're spelling it with like Y's and J's and K's and strange things mm -hmm. and hyphens. Please, keep it simple. People can't find you, they can't remember the name of your company because it's so convoluted. That's really bad. Another one I really think is fun is the curse of knowledge. Only insiders get it. So I was recently in, in a town at a street fair and I see this store and it's called, and it says, coming soon, Lunchbox. Has anyone heard of Lunchbox? You have, someone has, no? Okay, you gotta Google this when, when you leave here, okay? Write that down. So Lunchbox, it says, it said on it, coming soon, Lunchbox. I thought it was gonna be like a place where you pick up like boxes of food, right, for lunch. Oh no, it's a women's waxing salon. <laughs> okay. No joke, it's true. And I sat there and I took a picture of it and I sent it to Alexandra, the Eat My Words lady. I'm like, what the heck are they thinking? And she's like, I don't even want to talk about that one. That's nasty. But it's exactly what you think. It's a wax your box. I mean, that's, that's it. That's no joke. Go to their website. It literally says that. And the whole thing is supposed to be just tongue in cheek, really dirty, very expensive. And I thought, wow, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're literally popping up all over the country, which is ironic. But the idea that that, that, that name, for me, that brand didn't work. But just an example. Everybody got that? And this is me and some of my team. So I'm going to open up to questions. I really appreciate your time. And Go back one more sheet. You know, look at us. And before we get to the questions, <laughs> I do want to say that those of you who are scrambling on these notes, if you've dropped your card into the Infusionsoft uh, fishbowl, it's called Incentive, or give me your card, we will send you all this information. It's on video, uh, it, with PowerPoint, so we'll send that to you. And don't forget, if you ask for a demo as well, I want to ask you questions, we will give you a copy of the booklet as well. So, and when you ask a question, because we have a lot of people here, some people have to go, can you just not be, give a sermon, don't preach, don't, go, don't give Julie advice, question. just ask a question and let's go for it. Go, Julie. Can you send the thing around again to drop the business card? Uh, if that, yeah, if you, if you want to just give me your card, I can take it, or go to Infusionsoft booth. Okay. All right. But go ahead. Question for Julie. Yeah. I'm sorry this is a short question, but how did you get on the show? <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold for a second. Does anyone actually have a branding question first? I'm going to ask that first. Okay. We're going to address that. Yes. How did you build the show? So literally, you know, because I had experiences building two other companies before and with branding, I actually hold a master's degree in administration and marketing and a doctorate degree. So I've had some experience with it, I won't lie, but the truth is I grew up in entrepreneurship, my parents owned retail stores growing up, and I loved working on their brands, and that was part of what I did as a kid. I think it's just built in me, so, but branding, and from day one, I knew I wanted my brand to be something that people knew it, count on it, 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 and knew what they were going to get, and it really goes right back to the what. It's making sure that you understand that every single time someone thinks of your brand, they are thinking the same thing. Now, it could be a different thing for each person. That's okay. Someone could say dependable, someone could say high quality, but you want them to think it every single time, and that's the really the deliverance of going back to the what. It's so important that you understand your what and you deliver on it every single time. Awesome, thank you. are welcome. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Anything else about branding? Answered all your questions. Okay, how did I get on Shark Tank? Um, I did not get on Shark Tank the typical way that people do, which is like auditioning and sending in videos and all of that. So my story isn't really going to help anybody, to be honest. But um, the long and the very short of it is, um, I'm part of a lot of women's entrepreneur groups in New York City. I highly recommend that you join entrepreneur groups in your participatory in your community. 
And in doing so, the very first year that Shark Tank aired, they had approached this group that I was part of, and four of the women in my group were actually on the first season of Shark Tank. Um, I was asked to be on it, and I said no, because I don't think you should ever go on a reality show you haven't seen before. You don't know what you're getting into. Um, and the second season, they approached me again, and I said fine. So that's how I sort of, and I literally, within a week, I was in California filming it. Um, also, I can't say more than say you should continue to watch Beyond the Tank in the fall, and maybe we'll see you there. Maybe. <laughs> I can't say anything like that. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Brandon, if you're not happy with your business, um, like, I mean, I like the logo, that's good, mm -hmm. but I'm not branded in the best way possible yet. Which, any resources to turn to or to... There's, there's a lot of great you know, information on the internet and you want to read it with a great salt. There's like things like the, the, um, the duct tape entrepreneur is really great, for example. But I would often say that you, know, you really want to start, if you don't have a great social media presence, you do want to have that. And you want to make sure that in social media you're putting out what you want to. So I'm often making product that I don't think represents my brand maybe as much. So when I put things out on social media, it's because what I want people to perceive as our product, is what we do. And so I'm trying to shape the perception of my brand and my company through social media every day. It's a very big part of it. That's the one place to start. I'm happy to talk about it more with you. Okay. Like, sure. Do you have advice about finding out about women entrepreneur groups in the city? Yes. So they're always changing and growing. Unfortunately, some of the ones that I was participating in at that time are actually not around anymore. But I would highly recommend that you look into Count Me In, Ladies Who Launch, Savor the Success. Those are all for women, but for across the board, you want to look at um, entrepreneurs organization, EO is another mm -hmm. great one, um, and uh, BMI is another great one. And Wix is having an event. I don't know if it's, I heard it's political, but lean in. I heard some people go, oh, some people go, oh, but they're having an event. I'm hosting it with the, the meetup, lean, lean in meetup group founder. Cool, so. very cool. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi, um, I made it to the second round of Shark Tank for season seven. Um, I have a question. Is it true that they own 5% of your business for life? Okay, let's dispel the myth right now. They do not own any of my company. None of it. That is a myth. It is not true. There is something in the contract that says they can option it at any point within five years. No one has been optioned. I'm part of a very tight Shark Tank group. No one has been optioned. And the fact is, Mark Burnett does not need $2,000 from you and $2,000 from you. I think if someone ever became the next pet rock, he might take his piece. But no, it is not true. Nobody owns any part of my business. I bootstrapped it myself. No one's ever put a penny in my company but me. Anyone else? And I think we're done. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Can we give Julia a